Good evening. This is to convene the February 16th meeting of the board of the Wilmette Library trustees. All the notices have been given out. We are meeting remotely. And I would like to call the meeting to order at 6.02. Trustee Barshis, can you do the roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Here. Trustee Johnson? I'm yes. here. Oh, you're here. OK, nice to get you back. Trustee Riddle? Here. Trustee Rogers? Here. Trustee Wolf? Here. And Trustee McDonald? Here. Did you get Trustee Riddle? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Good. Thanks. OK. All right, we're also joined by a number of guests and um, I'd like to just introduce the folks that I'm seeing around the screen here this evening. Mm -hmm. um, I see that we have a few guests from the League of Women Voters. I see Pam Lurie and uh, Georgia Gebhardt. I also see um, representatives from the staff. I see uh, Gail Justman, John Risco, Marty Belfontaine and Marcos Levy. I also see um, representatives from our capital repair project, our construction manager, Jason Perkunis, John Shales, and Nathan Van Dytem. And I also see um, two of our candidates for trustee as well. I see Marianne O'Keefe and Tracy Summer. And I think that's everyone. Um, if I haven't called on you, would you just wave right now? And I'm not seeing anyone waving, so I think that's everyone. Okay, thank you. At, okay. This at this time, we are open for public comments. Is there anyone that would like to address the Board of Trustees at this time? If so, show your face and raise your hand. I'll call on you. Seeing none, we will move on to the minutes. You have a draft of the January 19th 20, 21 minutes. Can have we have a motion to approve the minutes? I will motion that we approve those minutes. Is there a second? Um, I also want to point out, as was noted in an email from Anthony, that the um, date that is shown for the minutes of January 19th is missing the year. Uh, and so that needs to be incorporated into these minutes. Um, so I move, I actually, my second, I'm hoping that, that uh, Stuart will, will agree that the motion should be amended, that the minutes be approved as amended by adding the date. I, uh, I should have said it to begin with, and so I certainly approve of that. So yes, I, I motion that we approve the minutes with the amended date to reflect uh, uh, January 19th, 2021. Okay, it has uh, been so moved by Stewart to approve the amended meeting, uh, to approve the minutes with the amended date to reflect the year 2021 instead of 2020 and seconded by Trustee Rogers. Is there any discussion? There was no year in the minutes as, as we okay. received them. So they didn't say 2020, they didn't say 2021. Right. We just said January 19th. 19th, 20, nothing. Okay. Right. Okay. Got it. Any discussion? Nope. Okay. Can we have a vote to approve it? Trustee Barshis? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. The motion passed unanimously. There are no presentations. So at this time we will move to Trustee Rogers for the treasurer's report. Okay, you have a copy of the treasurer's report. Uh, it was sent separately uh, from the other materials. Um, the primary um, uh, revenue received in January 
was $41,573 from the Kenilworth contract. Um, we received uh, around nine, well, almost $10,000 in general fund interest and a little over 9,000 in personal property tax proceeds. Um, expenditures are running um, under the six month projected rate. Um, so we're, you know, we're still within budget. Um, the expenditures for the month were, were normal operating expenses for primarily books and materials uh, and computer support and health insurance. Um, I, uh, we also have the January um, bills and salaries. I move that we approve the January bills and salaries. I'll second. Any questions about the bills and salaries? Ron, did you say uh, we were running under budget? I missed the percentage we were under budget. If you wouldn't mind repeating that for me, please. Expenses are at 52% and the projected six month rate was 58%. That takes into account some expenditures that occur uh, early in the year because they have to do with things like renewing subscriptions and other expenses that are billed on an annual basis rather than monthly. <laughs> Do we know, maybe it's a question for Anthony, do we know what we anticipate running at or we anticipate being 8% below? Do we anticipate coming closer to 100? What, what do we learned after six months? Well, I think what we've learned after six months is that we still have six months left of the fiscal year. So um, yes, we are a little bit short on it at the moment, but um, we do have a number of projects that we anticipate will be dropping here in the, in the near term. And uh, we anticipate that there will be some additional expenses. There's also an item on the agenda here this evening that will encumber a fair amount from our equipment and computers line. Um, so that should get us, I think, a little bit closer to where we were anticipating to be around this time. But um, I think what we've allocated for the budget for this year is still appropriate. And I think we're still on target to meet that budget. Last question then. So we are likely to be another year uh, fourth on my term, at least, where we are likely to come in under budget for actual expenses, or this time we might actually get to 100%. We get to we get as close to 100 as we can, and we've we've gotten pretty close the last couple of years. So that's that's still our goal. That was our budgeted goal at the outset, and that will remain our our effort here for the course of the rest of the fiscal year. Thank you very much. Any other questions regarding the budget? It's been moved and seconded that we approve the bills and salaries for January 2021. Can we have a roll call? Trustee Barsis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? I'll vote no. Okay, Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay. We now are going to move into action items and we are gonna first start with the capital repair project bid package number one. And we've got representatives, Director Austin, do you wanna start us off and Thank you. Yes, um, we are joined this evening by three of the figureheads that are guiding our project. We're really excited to have them with us this evening and to give a little bit more shape to what we're talking about here. Um, so we did go out to bid um, and um, we received some results and um, we're here this evening to review those results. We're, um, we're doing two bid packages for our capital repair project that's slated to begin this summer. And um, again, we've reviewed the scope of this and all that information is in your packet there. Um, so the first set of, of bids that we have is on the masonry and um, roof portions of this project. Next month, we'll be doing this again and we'll be reviewing more information related to the more interior aspects of the project and primarily the electrical uh, security and uh, fire uh, safety um, packages that go with this project. Um, but um, 
unless you have any question about the scope of the project, um, I guess I'd like to turn this over to Jason at this point to talk about what, uh, what our bidders brought to us and what we learned from the bidding process. Sure. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks, uh, yeah, so I, I presented the, uh, I think the RTA recommendation to award as well as the uh, bid tabulations are included. Uh, we did uh, overall, uh, it's a great bidding environment that we were out to bid on. Uh, we invited uh, about just over 30 uh, bidders, uh, got nine total bids, um, five for masonry and four for roofing. So great, uh, great participation with those two scopes of work. Uh, bid numbers were really tight. We sat down with uh, each and uh, each of the each of the apparent low contractors to qualify their bid, uh, made sure they understand the scope. Make sure they're previous, you know. Make sure they have relevant experience and are able to do the scope of work. Uh, both of uh, both of which check the boxes for each of these bidders. Um, so overall, uh, from our design development budget uh, and the roofing, overall we're about twenty three thousand dollars under budget from what we expected. Um, so I, I, there's a spreadsheet also, I, I believe, included that uh, reflects that um, and shows the comparison of DD to uh, uh, actual bid results. So uh, the roofing, uh, the, the bid amounts also include alternate one, which essentially is, uh, uh, you have uh, roofs that were done in the mid 2000s, mid and late 2000s. This is basically putting a coating and uh, basically having the warranty start for that on 2021. So those roofs will be good under warranty through 2041, which is great. And then the rest of your roofs will be under, uh, still covered under the, the 2015 roofs, which uh, expires in 2035. So great, uh, great opportunity. And you won't really, shouldn't have to worry about your roofs for quite a while. <laughs> so. Of course, we have 11 roofing surfaces on the roof. So yes, yes. And, and, and three, and, and, and three different, Types of three different manufacturers and types of roofs too. So, <laughs> so, um, so, so in the scope of the roofing is to repair all the uh, anomalies or uh, roof leaks, and then put a coating over uh, a portion of those uh, roofs. So. Do you think the snow will show some more? I mean, all the snowfall will show some more. And why is this environment more, comp you said it's a very good environment to go out to bid. What makes for that? Uh, it's just, uh, we've just been finding uh, just, there's a lot of uh, eagerness by the bidders to uh, fill up their schedule. Um, and especially the time of bid and when we're starting, it fits really good because we're, we're basically starting out of the gate uh, with the mason and we're fitting the roofing in right before the summer um, workload comes in. So it's, it's, it's a very, uh, between the, the time we're bidding and the schedule, those both uh, equate to a, uh, you know, a good numbers we're, we're seeing. So we, we were very pleased with that. I hope that answers your question. I, so. Dina, you had a question? I think you had one more question about the snow, Lisa. I'm looking at my roof and I'm wondering, does more stuff appear? Will you find more? Is oh, damages? Good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's a good time to find if where the weaker links are at this point in time when it thaws out. Uh, yeah, we, we, we will. So what we, what we did initially is we did a uh, thermal scan of the roof and, and identified areas that were uh, saturated or water in the roof system. And uh, we, we bought the job out based on those uh, quantities for that roof. So to your point, if it's snowing, you know, when it's, uh, you know, if there's more water that goes into the system. Uh, once we open those up, we, you know, they, those, those anomalies might get a little larger, but we do have a unit price built in the contract to uh, attack that and make sure we're doing it right. So if they find more if they find more damage, we will assess that and, mm -hmm. and take care of it. But yeah, we're definitely, uh, testing the roof once this all the snow melts up here for sure are these full replacement contracts these are not full replacement contracts so this is repairing anomalies and going with a coating 
um, which which provides a 20 year warranty to uh, the library. Okay, are there any changes in the um, industry requirements for insulation and uh, other levels of protection within the system that we didn't have at the time these were installed? If we if we were doing a full replacement, it would require those changes because of uh, because of uh, this being a repair and a, and a and a coating. We're not opening up the insulation. We're not uh, subject to those requirements per code. Okay. By the way, I write the exam for licensing looking contractors for the state of Illinois. Okay. All right. Um, so then, so these are these are replacement and or, or uh, repair. Uh, and recoding, not replacement. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jason, hi. This is Fina. I wanted to just say thank you for um, um, for presenting this in 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 the narrated format that it was. And what I really I think like to see that stood out was obviously that the um, the bid amount was about you know, 23,000 less than we expected. That was <laughs> great. Shales McNulty expected. That is great. So I understand it's the timing you say, it's the timing of the project is what's helpful or beneficial for us right now? Or, or was it that, you know, did Shales McNulty have an assumption that uh, maybe, you know, didn't come out to, to fruit, didn't come out to be kind of relevant for us? What, what would you say is that? Um, this is John Shales, uh, by the way. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, that's part of the bidding environment is to, um, there is a little bit of a known what the, that final pricing will be for, uh, say from manufacturers uh, and how Masons will look at different projects. Uh, so uh, there's always a little bit of, um, um, you know, uh, experience that go goes into those uh, estimates on the front end at that point. So, and as Jason pointed out, the, the bidding environment, uh, we couldn't pick a better time of year, uh, whether it's no matter what year it is, to be bidding out types of work like this because contractors are looking to fill up their uh, dance card, if you will, uh, for the coming spring and, and into the summer. Uh, you know, plus with uh, what's taking place with COVID and whatnot, uh, there's still, uh, there's a lot more uh, demand for work than there is supply right now. So that worked in your favor too. So right. people are taking work for a little bit less, a um, little less profit to make sure they can keep their people busy, all those kinds of good things too. So That's in the library. Kind of good to hear. Thank you. Any other questions? This one may be a little off scope. Um, didn't we talk, I thought Jan brought it up about um, whether this work makes it possible for us to put solar panels on the roof. If this is outside the scope of the project, we can do it. We can discuss some other time, but uh, is that something we have some insight in? Let me start that one off and then may, uh, maybe Nathan, you can address that. The work that we're doing is not precluding you from adding any uh, panels in the future at all. So uh, the systems okay. that we're installing are, are not, um, you know, don't weigh into that equation at all. Mm -hmm. Right, I'd like to kind of couple on that sentiment. Uh, it does not, uh, yeah, address solar panel issues. We would have to also look at structural loading for that in the future as to whether, uh, you know, some of the wind uplift and the loads could support the solar panels with your roof system. That was not done as part of this project. Nathan, is there some time where it might uh, would dovetail with other things we're doing so we could get that assessment? Yeah, it could uh, dovetail with future work. Uh, I don't want to speak uh, too much. Uh, what the future plans of the library are and uh, whatnot. But uh, as far as this project goes, the coding was a, a cost-effective manner to extend the life of your roof. Mm -hmm. Well, and this, this set of uh, specifications were based on things that need repair. Um, adding solar panels would be a totally different um, agenda uh, because that would be a in addition to um, library infrastructure, uh, not maintenance of the current system. Right, I, well, I guess, again, not being an expert in this area, what I wondered was while there's being work done on the roof, whether it's a re, you know repairs we're discussing now or anything else that we would have uh, in motion, could there be a, you know, a little time spent on assessing the, the solar panel option? 
but we need to make the judgment that we wanted to have the engineering studies done to determine what the capacity of the roof would be to handle the additional load. It's likely that it would be feasible, but it's something we haven't asked for yet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I will bring that. Um, I would like to bring that. Up. I'll, I'll plan on bringing that up in, in committee then, because I think that's something we should make. Not as our. It should be a focus. We should we should uh, address. So, so. Thanks, Stuart. Yeah, did I just thought Jan mentioned when she brought it up a year ago that we needed this repair done first, and then we could talk about it. So yeah, it feels like yeah. this is an appropriate time. For it seems to make sense to be right to, okay. to kind of take this step first and then the next step afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't want to put panels on a leaky roof. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then obviously, what, what, you know, if and when those panels come about, you you know, we just have to coordinate with Tremco or, you know, the, the, the manufacturer to make sure we're doing the proper penetrations and not avoiding the warranty. But that's, right. it's, it's pretty typical for the, for a solar panel retrofit. Right. Okay. right. So, but I think first you'd need to see what cost you'd be saving with the solar panels versus what we're doing now before. And that's been one of the reasons right. why we've not looked into it based on what our cost structure is now. Mm -hmm. there, are there any more questions? Yes, Joan? Lisa, um, and others, I seem to, when we put in that whole system that went up on the roof, the heating and the thermal, um, geothermal units, I, I take it those are po probably on a different of our 11, a different roof than the ones that we're looking at. Is that the case? Geothermal's in the ground. What's oh, in the ground? Oh, I thought we put right. something up top too. We did. We replaced the HVAC. The that were HVAC. Oh, I have my systems so, confused. Right. The, the, the compressors that were replaced were part of the 1986. Uh, building project. So they were ready to be replaced, but those are not related to the geothermal. No, no, no. I, I'm confused on that then. Yeah, the wells that were drilled in the front yard of the library um, were what support the geothermal system. But I thank you I, for that correction. But my question was, were there compressors up top on the roof that will be, but maybe that we have so many roofs that they're on different roofs than what we, than um, two, four, five, six, A and seven and eight. The roofing surfaces that have the compressors on them are not included in these specifications. Okay, that, that's, that's where I was going with that. Thank you. I think the intention is to uh, coordinate the roofing work on those surfaces with when the um, compressors need to be replaced. Got it. I know we've talked about it in the past. Yeah. Thank you for revisiting that. Because one got of the it. reasons we're just extending it is because is you've got to get a crane and take everything down. So if you extend it, then it was to have it more economical when you can just do it all at the time. All at once. Mm -hmm. Got it. I think, but I don't know technical, technical terms, but that's the old Thank point. you. Any other questions? No, thank you for your work, all of you. Is there a motion to approve? Uh, we also have the masonry and tuck pointing package that's in here. The question we need to determine is whether we want to make one motion addressing both um, contractors or whether you want to deal with these separately. Hmm. Well, to we... Go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, I was just going to ask Ron what, what his sense uh, is of answering that question. <laughs> I don't see any difference. It's, it, I mean, we're going to award uh, two contracts, one to Berglund for the masonry work right, and, and one to Marshall for the roofing work. And it could be in two motions or a single motion. That's not going to have a significant impact on the work that needs to be done. It's all going to be supervised under our construction management contract with SA. Right. Ron, can I ask each of the two contracts of how much are they? $6 million capital? 
I'm sorry, you were breaking up. I didn't get your question. Oh, I'm sorry. Is this any better? Yes. Um, so this is coming out of our uh, $6 million capital fund. Um, call in. These are eligible to be paid for out of the capital receipt. And how much is each one? Marshall. The, uh, yeah, the uh, Berglin is $197,000 for the masonry restoration work and the roofing work is $264,400. Well, your call, Mr. Uh, Chairman, but I'm happy to do it. I'd suggest we just do them together, but whatever you think, Ron. I would agree. I think I don't think there's really any, um, you know, benefit in voting for them separately or motioning for them separately. We have the document in one, or we have the information in one document, and we've discussed right. it. So, is there a motion? Is there a motion to approve the bid for 461,000 for masonry and tuck pointing and roof repairs? I will motion to make that um, uh, that um, uh, to approve this bill to spend no more than four hundred sixty-five thousand dollars on masonry and and rooftop repairs uh, that we've discussed. I'll there, second. Okay, and that's Trustee Dan Johnson. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? It's nope. been it's been moved by. <laughs> I'm getting crazy now, Trustee Wolf to approve the uh, masonry contract not to exceed 400 masonry masonry and tuck pointing and roof repairs to award it to L. Marshall and to award it also to Berglund Construction Company for the masonry work not to exceed $465,000. It's been mm -hmm. seconded by Trustee Johnson. Can we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. And thank you. And so it, the motion passed unanimously. Yeah. And so now I we're going to- have a question about the bid package number two. Um, is the water infiltration project included in that package? Or will that be following package two? Uh, yes, the uh, we're going to do that internal uh, drain tile system as part of uh, bid package two, okay. and then there's some drywall and remedial work as well. Um, just uh, uh, as well. So in addition, the biggest portion of the project is going to be the uh, electrical, but there is that component mm -hmm. um, to the uh, project as well. For the question I have about the water infiltration is whether there is any consideration and value in adding um, protection from infiltration to the exterior of those uh, foundation walls. Uh, the issue with that is the location because it's right where the tie in between the uh, basement and that yeah, th this was kind of the first, uh, let, let's try this and see if it, it, it we're going to put a drainage man on the inside of the foundation mm -hmm. that would take care of any infiltration that we would expect. Uh, the seepage we were noticing uh, was more like coming, it was more like a hydraulic uh, coming from the floor. Okay. Uh, so our, our goal is to try to as process it before we tear up, it, before we have to tear up the outside, let's try this solution Okay. Um, is, the, is the strategy. For, uh, okay, because I've used both in my residence. Okay. Concurrently. All right. Both interior footing drains and a drainage capture system um, and exterior Volclay panels. And the question is, if, if this is for, from hydraulic pressure under the floor, then that would not apply in this case. Correct. Yeah. It, yeah. You know, I, I, I totally understand that and agree. 
Uh, we believe that that's where the uh, water is coming from is underneath the floor, especially in the location in between the building additions. Uh, to even get to the um, wall side, the outside wall side of the wall that we're talking about is actually in a crawl space underneath one of your additions at that point. So it, it's much harder to get to than even just digging up the outside of the building. Okay. So um, it, uh, Jason and I have spent quite a bit of time uh, in the basement looking at this, kind of looking behind shelves, looking under carpet and whatnot. We be believe we've got a pretty good handle on how to um, solve this issue for you uh, based on the existing drain system that you have in the adjacent building as well. So uh, mm -hmm. it's kind of a, a couple of things coming together there that really um, we believe is going to provide a solid solution for you economically. Okay. I was just asking to determine whether or not the you know, your evaluation had included looking at that question. And it For sounds sure. like it has. Mm -hmm. Okay. You want to proceed, Trustee Rogers, with the Finance Committee recommendations on our audit services contract? Yes. Um, the Finance Committee reviewed the proposal from Lauterbach and Amon, uh, or Amon. I'm not sure how they prefer that that be pronounced. Um, We've recommended, they are the low bidder. We've recommended a three-year contract totaling $26,400 uh, for audit services. Um, this work would begin shortly for the um, audit of the 2020 fiscal year. Um, we have in the past several years used, uh, actually for, almost, for about 10 years, we've used sickage um, and uh, the Lauterbach bid was lower, um, and uh, we think it meets all of the, all of our criteria. So the uh, finance committee recommended that we proceed to uh, contract with Lauterbach and Amund for audit services for the next three years. Typically, these project or these contracts are rebid uh, every five to seven years. Um, and because of the changes in directors and other factors, uh, we went longer with sickage than that usually occurs. But the, in this case, it's time for us to switch. Uh, it's more of a uh, simply a protection for the library not to um, use the same auditing firm uh, forever. So there's nothing wrong with what we've been doing in the past. Uh, but it's simply good business practice to change the audit firm periodically just to maintain the, the independence of the results that you receive uh, as a board. So the Finance Committee is recommending approval of the Lauterbach and Amund proposal. As such, I move that we approve the contract with Lauterbach and Amund for audit services for the next three years. Um, in a sum uh, not to exceed $26,400. Two years or three years, Ron? Three, three years. Three years. Okay. I will second that motion. Okay, Trustee Rogers moved that we approve the um, contract for audit services for the next three years with Lauterbach and Amon. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, for 26,400, Trustee Wolf seconded it. Is there any discussion or questions? It's been booed and seconded by Trustee Rogers and Trustee Wolf. Can we have a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle? Yes. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The motion passed unanimously. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to turn it over to Director Austin to discuss the computer view, computer view firewall upgrade project. Thank you. Um, so you've got information in your packet that's been provided by computer view. CVI is the library's land management firm. They work in concert with our IT department to provision management of our local area network as well as um, the, the control of our firewall. And as you may know, a firewall is the network security device that monitors incoming and outgoing network traffic and decides whether or not to block traffic on those lines based upon security um, protocols. 
Um, it establishes a barrier between the secured and controlled internal networks that we trust and um, those outside networks that may be untrusted, like the internet. Um, so this is um, the primary source of, um, of security for uh, a data infrastructure. So firewall is one of the most important pieces of equipment, um, either hardware or software, and in this case, it's both. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's an equipment that needs to be replaced on a regular basis. And as you can see, CVI has made a recommendation that we are due uh, for an upgrade. Uh, the particular equipment that is being proposed for us um, this evening is considered a next generation firewall, um, which goes above and beyond what the existing unit is that we have in place, and then takes it a little bit further with some uh, diagnostic resources. I could get into a lot of detail about what the purpose of this equipment is and why we're using it, um, but I don't want to spend too much time on it if it's something that you don't want to get into the weeds about. So I'm going to just leave it at that and see if you have any questions and then we can discuss a little bit further. Yes. Generally, how long, uh, how long does a firewall system last and does it impact our insurance? if we have the new firewall system? That's a good question. Um, so typically um, hardware for, for of this sort, we would wanna replace every five to seven years. And we are certainly within that time frame. This, this system has lasted us um, a long time um, and is now outmoded. In terms of your question about, um, so we, we, enter, we always budget for this type of replacement every five to seven years as we would with a lot of our server equipment. Um, this particular piece of equipment relates to our insurance, but does, but does not actually either make, it, make our insurance cheaper um, or more expensive. It simply um, reinforces that we have some additional insurance on top of it in the form of cybersecurity. Um, so you may remember a while back when we were talking about our Lyra um, scope of services that cyber was, was included um, in that, and this would protect against any out, outside threat to the library. Um, uh, so this is, you know, a, a, double, a double element in terms of the, uh, the, the infrastructure security that we would have. So we have a policy as well as hardware that would block any of those threats. I would suggest that we um, amend our past schedule and look at this every three to five years. Uh, the uh, threats um, have increased substantially. And I think we wanna be particularly alert to uh, the need if there is any to um, keep this system up to date. Um, the, you know, the, um, uh, as is shown in the, the last chart uh, that is with the CVS material, um, the, the volume of threats has increased significantly, exponentially. Um, and, you know, we, while we're not as vulnerable as a lot of applications, we do not want to uh, take the risks that could be associated with not uh, looking at this often enough. Uh, so, you know, and of course we do have the benefit that I think uh, Computer View is, is, uh, has been an effective partner in keeping on top of this. But um, I think our schedule in looking at this issue might need to be more frequent than five to seven years. Um, and just to be clear about that, I mean, that is an industry recommendation. Um, we review our, our network infrastructure on a more regular basis than that. Um, and obviously we're gonna replace things when it is necessary to do so. From a, from a fiscal standpoint, we're looking at, the, at this infrastructure on a five-year basis. CVI obviously is, as you said, a strong partner with us and makes recommendations relative to the equipment and the needs of the organization. So we would certainly be responsive to that. So we're not bound by you know, a schedule necessarily. We do what we think is absolutely necessary for the organization, but thank you for that, Ron. Any questions about Anthony, the, yeah, go ahead, Fina. Excuse me, excuse me, didn't mean to interrupt. Anthony, my question was, what was the impetus of, I mean, was there just, it was just as a scheduled um, kind of revisiting? What was the impetus of? Yep, our equipment is outmoded. Um, the documents reflect that the threats have increased and there's new technology that's available to us and will increase the security of the network. Great. So hence the recommendation. Thanks. Anthony, um, 
does this is the five year or seven year replacement something that could potentially get out of our um, yeah. you know, capital budget or is that something that you feel like has to stay in our operating budget is this is not entirely new equipment um, this is not eligible for expenditure from the special reserve fund as is my understanding um, this was a project that we had budgeted for at the beginning of this fiscal year and therefore it's part of a general fund budget for expenditures this year well, if we could uh, revisit that, uh, you know, we've got a ton of money in that capital fund quite sweetie. Uh, and so it'd be the more we could spend out of that six million from my perspective, the better, but I wouldn't want to hold it up tonight. But I imagine that we could, if there's an appetite, revisit at a later time. Thank you, though. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, sorry for my colleagues participation in that one. Uh, just one comment to, to Trustee Johnson's comment. Um, Dan, because we have a bunch of capital improvements that are coming up soon, if you've reviewed the, the, the documents from the last board meeting, you'll see that a lot of the money that you're concerned about is already, is already accounted for and addressed um, in the money we've set aside. So certainly want to use that money the most uh, efficient and, and cost effective way for the community, but we can't, we have to keep the, 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 nice, the, very, the very effective plan that's been put together by us by, uh, uh, by this uh, capital expenditure 20, 20, 25 year plan. Nowhere close to six million, though, right, Stuart? It's it's gonna it's gonna dip significantly into that amount, and so and and as I said, so we have to be we want to make sure that we're being prudent both for the library and for the community that we don't overspend it. So it's over two going. million dollars in this year's project, leaving us at least four for the coming years. But remember also that the total of the projects for capital needs over the next twenty years from our capital needs study. It's nearly eight million. Yeah, we're to, well, as we discussed earlier, that's about four hundred thousand a year, which is close to what our operating surplus is. But that's a conversation for another time. Okay, I would move that we approve the contract uh, with Computer View to proceed with the upgrades to our firewall um, in an amount not to exceed twenty-one thousand dollars. I'll second that. Okay, Trustee Rogers has moved to approve the proposed, proposed firewall upgrade project by computer view to amount not to exceed 21,000. Trustee Wolf has seconded the motion. We, any other additional discussion? Okay, having so, can we have a roll call? Trustee Barshish. Trustee Barshish, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle. Yes. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. Trustee McDonald. Yes. The motion passed unanimously to purchase the computer view upgraded firewall project. Okay, moving right along to discussion items and thank you. Uh, let's hear about the pandemic response plan. Okay. Or the snow or yeah, exactly. and the snow plan. And, and, and snow shake and the shake pandemic shake response snow. plan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's important that we do acknowledge that um, you know, we did have to to close the last two days due to the winter storm, which dropped, um, according to the National Weather Service, 16 inches on Wilmette as of 5 p.m. Um, 18 inches on Evanston and northern parts of Chicago, and that's where a lot of our staff are. Um, so staff certainly appreciates not having to risk life and limb to get into the building um, today. Um, but staff did a wonderful job. Um, I need to really commend my facilities team, and Marcos is on the call. So Marcos, I can thank you personally here. Um, he, Marcos was on site yesterday and today with Keith and um, did an outstanding job of getting the walkways and um, uh, the spaces that are adjacent to the parking lot pickup area cleared of snow. Um, as that's an area that is difficult for the plows to reach when they go through the lot. So um, did a tremendous job of getting that area cleaned out so that we can be ready for service first thing tomorrow morning when we reopen and resume our services. Um, so as I said earlier, we did uh, suspend our on-site services on Monday and Tuesday. However, we were available for all of our regular um, email and chat reference services from 10 to 6 and offered our virtual programs 
as we usually planned them to be. Um, for those folks who did have an appointment for parking lot pickup on Monday and Tuesday, we're letting them come by the library Wednesday and Thursday, Friday, whenever, at their convenience to pick up those items. You don't need to reschedule an appointment to come by. We're going to honor that. Um, we have their materials already bagged and prepared. Um, when the staff gets in tomorrow morning, we're going to prepare all the items that were due to be picked up for Wednesday and Thursday and uh, to un unpack all the materials that have been stacking up from the deliveries that we've received over the last two days and what we're anticipating for tomorrow and to try to get those holds processed so that we can begin that cycle all over again and get those new materials ready for the patrons. Um, all of that said, um, we were planning to um, open the library on Monday and we are still ready to go forward with that, but the snow really kind of wreaked a bunch of havoc on us, as I just said, and it's, it's a lot for us to have to dig out of this and I think it would really impact our services if we were to try to pivot to reopen the building tomorrow after being closed for three months. So I really appreciate your, your understanding and um, allowing us to, to just give us another day or two to get coordinated here inside the building before we resume access to the building for the public. Um, but we're really excited um, to be able to safely welcome the public back to our building. And we're gonna do so um, with a few changes this time around. And I wanna kind of briefly outline some of the things that we're gonna be doing um, this time around with the reopening. So we are targeting opening the building this Friday. Um, I really don't anticipate any weather that's gonna get in the way of us doing it this time around. Um, so here's kind of what we're gonna be doing this time around. So for folks who are in the library from July through November last year, um, when we were reopening from the pandemic, you can expect a very similar experience this time around with a few minor modifications. Um, first and foremost, we did expand our Saturday hours um, by two hours till 5 p.m. So we're open 10 to 5 on Saturdays, getting really close back to our original hours there. That was the number one demand from our patron survey late last year um, in terms of what folks were looking for was access on Saturday afternoons. Um, in an effort to reduce cash handling, we're also um, disabling the, the coin towers on our printers, scanners, and, and fax machines, and, and, and uh, copy machines, rather, in the building. So uh, printing, scanning, and copying is going to be free for the first 20 pages. Um, we anticipate most folks will be able to complete their business here in tax season um, without the need to have to juggle change or for us to have to make change for folks. Um, we frequently find that the time that we invest for accounting the change actually amounts to a little bit more than what we're collecting. And because the pandemic is saying that change handling is maybe not the best approach for us right now, um, we're going to just temporarily suspend this operation for the period of the near future. Um, as part of our RFID project, and I'll give a little bit more info about that here in a moment, we've launched two new self-checkout stations on the first floor. Um, and uh, we're excited to have those up and running. We um, have, we're gonna be resuming our open holds concept, which patrons are familiar with from, well, pre-pandemic times. Uh, so patrons can now enter the library, pick up their own materials and check them out just as they did before the pandemic. Um, we have some, some new procedures that are associated with that. Um, all of this is part of a coordination, coordinated effort through, the, through a state statute to protect patron privacy, as well as an effort that was coordinated through our consortium CCS. So there's new printers that we're using with sticky tape on them that we're wrapping materials with to make it easier for us to um, essentially hide the title of the item and conceal the name of the individual who's requesting that item when they're on open hold shelves. So the formula that you're gonna need when you come in to pick up your holds is your last name, the first four letters of your last name, your first initial and the last four digits of your library card. Now, most folks will be able to pretty much find their item just by looking at the shelf and they'll see their things there. Um, if you need to dig a little bit deeper, then just pull out your library card and you can see the last four digits and that'll make it a lot clearer uh, for folks that might have really similar last names. This is a convention that is already used throughout the state and throughout our, our um, consortium. Uh, a lot of our patrons are already familiar with this. Um, we adopted this system concurrent with the introduction of our uh, RFID system. Um, so that's the open holds. And then we've also made a number of changes to the collections, um, making them easier to browse and access. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in, in a minute. Um, but again, the, the, the major pieces that I think folks need to keep in mind when they're coming back to the library is all of our health and safety guidelines. Um, masks are always required inside the library right now. 
Um, we recommend that folks um, sanitize their hands before they come in, that you keep your visits brief, and uh, that you maintain social distance, all the basics um, that folks are ex um, experiencing throughout um, you know, society during the pandemic. So um, some of the other things that, that continue as before, no study rooms, um, study uh, seating areas and work tables have been removed temporarily. Um, there's no room rentals at this time. Our periodicals room is closed, but you can still request all the magazines. Um, we're not doing any in-person programming and, and possibly won't be doing that here at least through the summer, I would expect, um, at least until we're not having to quarantine materials because that's taking up a good portion of all of our uh, meeting room spaces in the lower mm -hmm. level. Um, toys, games, and other interactives will remain um, unavailable at this time. Um, there's no eating or drinking inside the library. Um, the friends in the library are not accepting material donations at this time, um, and BDU remains closed until further notice. We're hoping for a time when we can get our volunteers back in here, um, but we're going to keep everyone safe um, until the vaccine, I think, is a little bit more available in our community. Um, so those are kind of the key elements of our reopening strategy at this time. Um, parking lot pickup will continue for those folks who don't want to come inside the library, and we anticipate that that will still be popular with a number of folks. Um, I'm going to break there for a moment and see if anyone has any questions or comments about our pandemic service model for reopening. I think it all sounds really good, Anthony. My only question is what you said, uh, you're encouraging people to use hand sanitizer. Will there be sanitizer units when people walk in to the building handy for them? Yes, um, we have them uh, two units right at the front door when you come in, and then they're scattered throughout the library in various departments and next to each elevator. Good. So lots how of would, stations around. How will you? How are they easy to see? I mean, how would, how will you encourage people to actually use them? Um, I'm going to leave that to someone here who's maybe been in the library since we were open with all of those. Fina, are they easy to are they easy to see and use? Very easy. They, they're, you know, they're right when you walk in, you won't miss them. And they're throughout okay. the library, you won't miss them. And okay. there, there are plenty, which is, it feels really reassuring when you're walking around is, you know, if you want to touch something and put something in a bag and then get sanitized again, super easy. Mm -hmm. Kids, my kids loved it too. <laughs> Hands free. <laughs> okay. Anthony, one point of clarification, uh, you said that, um, uh, toys and games are not going to be available to be uh, uh, checked out, um, but that does that excludes video games. Is that correct? Where any patrons are on the call, video games will still be available. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, I, I need to be clear about that. So we we frequently have a number of puzzles and other interactive type games that um, the children can use in the the youth services department. Um, not necessarily things that people would take home, but that are just there to inter interact with. And mm -hmm. um, just to keep folks safe and knowing that a lot of hands are touching those right now, we decided to remove those last summer before we reopened. So yeah. it's just those. But video games are still available and all the Library of Things items actually are available to circulate again. We did withhold a few of those last summer, but now the entire Library of Things is available for circulation mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you. Anthony, I really liked the conveniences that are added, you know, the, um, the RFI, the checkout machines. I actually have not used them, but um, I'll, I'll look forward to using that. I think that can free up some of the, um, you know, the representatives, the staff at the, at the front too. Um, is it pretty user-friendly? I mean, I'm sure easy to follow. And, and um, secondly, um, I really like the, um, the generosity and I think that's a really nice convenience too of the paper copying especially now in tax season I know my mom used that a lot and she'd always have to make sure that you know they don't have a copy machine she still hands in her paper a paper tax statement so really nice but if you don't mind about the RFI machines yeah the checkout machine, sorry yeah, so the self-checkout machines that we've got, um, so we just added two more. Um, we received them on, gosh, on the 11th, they were installed. So they're still brand new. They've not been used by patrons yet. Um, and they're all configured and set up. And these actually come with, um, with a credit card um, reader on them as well to make payment for lost items a lot easier. Of course, we're fine free now. So folks aren't paying as many fines, but folks who visit from other libraries who may have a problem with their account can clear that up on those machines pretty easily too. Um, I think the machines, I'm a little biased, but I think these machines especially, are the, these are the ones that we bought last summer as well. We've got now four of them. 
Um, these are, I think, amongst the easiest to use of the self-checkout machines I've seen. Um, and uh, once we're able to enable the, the RFID feature on them, we'll, we'll do that once the collection is, I'd say, about 85% tagged. Um, they'll be even a lot easier because you won't have to hunt and try to find the barcodes on the items. But since our patrons are already very familiar with the two existing self-checkouts that we had previous to last summer, and now the, you know, I guess we've got six of them in place right now, um, I think folks are, are very much familiar with it and the kids love it. Um, that was the big <laughs> feedback that we got last summer is that you know, all the kids are fighting over you know, who gets to be the one to check out the, the materials. So um, I think that you'll, you'll find that they're really easy to use. And um, we've got one of the units now is, is displayed right next to where all the holds are. So it'll make it a lot easier for folks to come in and, and uh, check their items out immediately. Just a quick follow up to that. Uh, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dan. Oh, thanks. Quick follow up um, uh, to Fina's point. Uh, that struck me as well. It was interesting to hear that the cost of dealing with the quarters for the copying and the printing kind of um, paid for collecting it. So I'd encourage you to think about making that a permanent policy. If it's got to be a pain for some customers, it may not have a, a buck or two on them. So, um, yeah, if it costs us as much to deal with it, uh, it's something to think about once we move in. Um, and the other, on the uh, on the youth services, um, if you haven't had a chance, because I know it just came out, but those CDC guidelines on school reopenings feel like they may be some appropriate guidance for us to consider for in-person youth programming. Um, I think they're only a week old or so. So if you could get a chance to look at it, maybe with uh, you know Ms. Johnson and think about if that's relevant to us to do some in-person youth programming, we follow their guidelines for schools, uh, that might be a good metric for us to think about instead of sort of community vaccination, you know, general, you know, whatever it is, right? So something for you to, to pontificate and mull over and maybe think, talk about uh, as the weeks go by. Great, thank you for that. Um, and, and I did uh, just real briefly about the cashless, um, option just for a moment so everyone understands. When I say the cost of handling it is, is a little bit more than actually what we generate, um, that relates to this last, this, this last fiscal year. Obviously with, the, with less traffic in the building and fewer people using the equipment, it was costing us more to, to process um, all the change than it was than what we were actually collecting. Um, we'll see what, the, what this looks like when we come out of this pandemic year. Um, it's a pretty expensive contract on those machines and uh, for those coin towers. So there's certainly a lot of cost measures that we're going to be analyzing going forward. If it makes sense for us to go um, cashless for, for this system and, and no charge for, for those services, we'll certainly consider that. Uh, the consumables on those machines can be kind of expensive, but if it's the cost of doing business, we can certainly analyze that as, as a service to the community going forward. We'll, we'll certainly review that. Thank you. All right. What impact does that have on the copy? Because you've got some copy centers that make their money from making copies. So what impact does that have on some of the local businesses? Because there's one that was right across, used to be right across from the library. I'm just curious. Your guess is as good as mine. OK. <laughs> uh, Ron? Verification on the, um, uh, the RFID. Uh, those scanner or the, 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 the RFID readers are still going to need require that uh, books be scanned individually until um, enough of the collection uh, has the RFID chips in them to enable that feature. Um, what is the current timetable for when you would expect to have that feature uh, enabled? Well, Assuming there are no further questions about the pandemic response, I've got a heck of a lot of information to share with you about the RFID system. So um, I will address that in just a moment, unless there's anything else related to reopening or anything related to the pandemic. Hearing none, okay, RFID, yay. This is like what my life has been for the last couple of weeks. Um, all right, so um, as, as I said earlier, we were waiting for the collection to be tagged um, at a, about 85% before we're going to enable the RFID chip reader on all of our self-checkout stations. The reason behind that is because right now we're doing um, just barcode scanning. If we introduced the RFID feature and we've already tagged a portion of the collection, 
um, the system would not be able to distinguish which items were tagged and which items were not. So I think we would experience a bit of unintentional loss as a result of that. So as a security measure, we're still requiring all items to be checked out with their barcode until they're all tagged. So um, an update about the RFID project. Um, commencement of the project was unfortunately delayed due to some supply chain issues, and I talked about that with you previously. So we had intended to complete much of this project as part of the anticipated winter closure due to the pandemic. And we've only found ourselves just recently beginning the project as we're preparing to reopen. That's been kind of stressful. Um, nevertheless, we're finally underway and we anticipate that this work will continue um, even during our open hours um, as we work towards our completion goal in April. Uh, we still feel like we're gonna be able to get the entire collection tagged by the end of April. We've got a schedule, we've got staff that are available to do this. There are obviously a number of variables that go into this and there could be some delays, but we have three tagging carts that we've leased from Biblioteca that um, are on wheels that will roll around through the library and we'll be in the stacks with, um, with those carts. And we'll be tagging those items um, pretty much every hour that we're open to the public. Um, we'll just block off that aisle when the staff is working in there. We may also take carts into some other study rooms and whatnot and, and work in other areas when it's appropriate for us to do so. We'll be concurrently tagging all new material that's coming in through the technical services department and we're working out our procedures there. Um, we've created a document um, for every individual type of item that we have in the library to indicate where we're going to be tagging all those things uh, so that staff know exactly how to do that. And that was a, definitely a bit of work and props to the TS team and Jessica Thompson for her work in preparing all of that information for us. So um, as I said, we, we received our initial training on this project on February 2nd. We were hoping to have that training like two months prior to that. We were hoping to be well down the road and nearing the completion of this project at this time. Uh, we're only just getting started now. Uh, the first item that we tagged in the collection was tagged on February 3rd. So that was our milestone. Uh, the tagging carts themselves were configured and installed on Thursday the 4th of the month. And since that time, we have tagged the entire recent arrivals collection, our hot picks and large print collections. And we're um, on the process of tagging our new material as it comes in and trying to tag the items that are still being returned to the collections that have already been tagged so that we can keep track of all those materials. So our shelvers are really helping us out with that process as well. Um, we have two new self-checkout stations, as I said before, with credit card processing, and those were installed uh, last Thursday, the 11th. I'm anticipating to receive um, three more self-checkout stations. They're different models. Um, those are intended to be a little bit more glamorous and, and in high traffic areas near the circulation desk. Um, those will be installed sometime likely next week. I think they were also tied up due to the weather this week. So we're probably not gonna see them till next. They've got a bit of configuration before they're installed as well. So um, they may be up by the end of the month. That's our goal. Um, so that's kind of the deal with RFID. Like I said, we're targeting this project to be completed by the end of April, staff working on it every hour that we're open and even hours outside of our regular operating hours. So staff are in the building between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. every day, uh, two hours before we open and two hours after we close. And um, some folks are working on those hours, others will be doing it during the hours that we're open. Um, any other questions about RFID? If the self-checkout uh, unit is used or not, let's say somebody just forgets and walks out of the, tries to walk out of the library with a book that hasn't been checked out, is there some beep or a sun or something that goes off? <laughs> So the, the library will be getting new security gates as part of um, the, you may recall, we've talked about these details at, at when we were purchasing the system. So th there okay. will be new security gates that will be installed mm -hmm. um, near the close of this project once we're ready to light up the RFID system. So um, the last stage of the project will be the installation of the security gates and the automated material handling system that's gonna go behind the circulation desk uh, connected to the book drops on the west side of the building. Um, so those new security gates will actually also be eliminating the center post that um, is kind of there to divide traffic when you're coming in. Um, mm -hmm. It makes the entry a little bit wider and easier for people to navigate. So that's a, a nice feature that we're adding. 
The RFID mm -hmm. system also, to your point about the security of the collection, um, will also be able to track the material that's leaving the building that's not checked out. There's a lot of options that are available to us and we can configure it at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, the options that are available to us will be there can be, you know, a loud siren that will go off and demand that it can have an audit, it can have a voice that will tell you your item is not checked out, return to the desk. Um, you may have heard that in a retail environment. Um, there can be red flashing lights. Um, there's all <laughs> kinds of other features that'll go along with it. We can decide. We can also elect for it to be silent and to simply record the item that left the building. Either way, mm -hmm. we'll receive a report of any item that was not checked out um, that did go out the gates. So from an inventory standpoint, that's a substantial improvement over the system that we have right now that does mm -hmm. not capture that data. So we'll be able then to instantly mark the items that walked out of the building as missing. And then that will give us the ability to try to, you know, track those down through other inventory procedures going forward. Um, so that's, that's what that system will be enabled to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're not going to have horns and flashing lights and all kinds of good stuff going on. I don't, I don't think that's that's what the good people of Wilmette expect at the front door, but um, you know, it, it certainly isn't that way today, but we're going to analyze what the availability of that system is and what we think is appropriate at uh, that time, but uh, certainly nothing nothing like a loud blaring siren. Uh, fully. Okay. It's, available. it's just not something we would choose to use. Um, historically, one thing that's worth noting is that in 1975, when the library district became independent of the village. There were five entrances to the building and there was no security on anything. So this represents light years of improvement. And actually what we currently have was significantly better than the no security at all system that existed in 1975. So um, we, we make progress in steps. Uh, this is another step. I think it bears note here too that in my study of shrinkage at Wilmette Library that um, we have one of the lowest rates of missing material that I've studied. Um, I would estimate that it's it's certainly less than 8%, but probably closer to 4% shrinkage on an annual basis, mm -hmm. um, which I think definitely falls within um, the, the frame of the cost of doing business. Um, we do recover a lot of those materials. Um, so I, I think that from a security standpoint, um, the system that we've got in place already seems to be doing its job. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. All right, any other questions about the RFID project? All right, so the other projects, um, we've already talked about the capital repair project. Thank you for your action on that. Um, and the RFP for the audit services um, has officially closed and we can move forward with that contract. So thank you for that too. The other one that's in the motions right now, um, the capital repair project bid release two is out right now. Uh, so we're, we're collecting bids, our bidders are able to review that information. Um, the other one that's in the, in the works at the moment too is our website redesign project. So um, Stephen Koval, our digital services manager and I have been working on this project together. And um, we, uh, we, we posted that in January and bidders sent dozens of detailed questions to us about the project by uh, Friday, February 5th. And um, we responded to those questions on Wednesday the 10th. There were dozens of questions. There was a lot of interest in this project. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of folks are, are um, competing for this. Um, CCS, our consortium, also recently completed a project like this. And we reviewed a lot of their information um, as we were preparing for this project. So I do wanna give props to Rebecca Malinowski, the director of CCS for sharing some of her background information mm -hmm. with us about her RFP and um, sh for sharing some of the, the agencies that had bid on that project um, with me so that we could reach out to them as well to um, solicit some additional interest in our project. Um, our proposals are due on Thursday the 25th and we expect to review, interview and recommend a selected vendor in time to recommend a solution to the board for your approval on uh, March 16th. So at our next meeting, you'll have a lot more information about who we're gonna be selecting as our next website uh, developer. Um, any questions about the website process? 
Have you learned anything from the uh, people who've come in to look or offer their services for this that uh, is pertinent to what we should understand about the system? Um, I, I guess I would say maybe not so much at this point. Um, okay. once, we, once we have proposals in hand, I think we'll, we'll know a little bit more. But in terms of the questions, I can say that the bidders are very much engaged. And um, I think by the seriousness of the questions, we've got some pretty, pretty great responses. And I have high expectations for the types of proposals that we're going to see and the quality Good. of the results that they produce. Uh -huh. Thank you. Questions. Uh, one, are some of the uh, vendors already doing library, other libraries or work within the library? And therefore, you might save some, learn their best practices and save some money in terms of development? Thank you, Lisa. Yes, that is definitely one of the criteria. We wanted to have uh, mm -hmm. vendors who were experienced with public libraries um, in particular that understand that already speak our language, that know what we're trying to accomplish so that we don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. So yes. Yeah. I know your leadership team has been meeting in terms of what criteria they're looking for. How do you plan to engage the public in terms of the usability and ease of access in terms of some of the information that may not be so easily accessible? Great question. So there, there's a couple ways. So we actually have a committee. Um, there's a website redesign committee that's comprised of staff from multiple departments. Um, um, we believe that leadership exists at every level in the organization and that there are staff who can contribute to this project with a, with a diverse range of backgrounds. So it's not just our tech staff that are working on this committee. Um, so what we're also working on is developing personas, which are um, not real people, but we're but we're basically saying, you know, what would what would um, a mother of five children who's busy um, juggling all these other things, who really just wants to know this, that, and the other thing? How is she going to find this information on the website? Give her give this mm -hmm. persona an assignment and and see how easy it is for them to find this information. Um, that you know is just one example, but we've got you know half a dozen such examples of people that use our website. Um, that we've established personas for. So that's a virtual version of a focus group. But we do intend to have a focus group set up once the wireframes for the site are created. Um, we want to engage the public. So further down the road, once our, our, once our vendor has been selected, um, once our data has been compiled and a lot of our content has been migrated over to the wireframes of the website, which is a basic scaffolding of what the site's going to look like without its uh, glitzy design, um, then we can start the process of having individual discussions and meet with members of, of our own community who can then test out the site and see how it functions. Um, I do want to make sure that I'm explaining at this point that um, CCS um, uh, and the library and the library catalog are three different things. So the library's website um, is not the library catalog. I want to make sure that I'm explaining that because some of the things that we hear about about improvements to the library website are not in fact things that, that Wilmette Library can control. Um, so when you, if you're searching for books, movies, and music, um, you're generally searching in the library catalog, and that's Polaris. That is a system that is managed by Innovative Interfaces, which contracts with CCS. CCS has a website that, that their vendor, that their, their, um, their clients use, their library clients use, and that's what their website is that they're redesigning. They're not redesigning the catalog. So I just want to make sure that those points are all, all, are all distinct and understood. So we're redesigning our website, which is the way that we present all of our information to the public. Um, the catalog is a link that is embedded within it. It looks like it's seamless. Um, we will make sure that our new design um, is updated with CCS's design. You can see our logo in there, and that's what makes it look kind of seamless. But um, they're all distinct pieces. All right, anything else about the website before I move on to other projects? Okie doke. All right. I guess that kind of brings me up to my report. So I'm going to move on to item eight on the agenda and provide a little bit of a summary about what's been going on in January. Um, so a number of updates that relate to the collection. Um, this, is, this has been a really exciting time for us collection-wise. So big news um, on the digital front is that um, our January circulation uh, for our virtual services is amongst the highest that we've had so far in fiscal year 21. So Overdrive, Hoopla, and Canopy 
some of our strongest months um, were, were more than likely January. Um, so we're seeing a strong use um, of all of those features. And part of that may be due in fact to the, to, uh, the fact that Libby, our overdrive product, um, now has all of our RB Digital magazines in it. And this was quite a coup uh, for Overdrive when they were able to acquire RB Digital and to get the licensing for all of those magazines. Um, as you know, magazines um, are a collection that has not been as immediately accessible to our patrons in the wake of the pandemic. And um, we were really thrilled that um, we've seen digital usage of our magazines go up pretty sharply since the introduction of this new service here um, in January. So if you haven't checked it out already, um, it's really cool to have a glossy magazine right there on, on your phone or your iPad or to browse on, on your computer. Um, they're instantly accessible. Um, there's no waiting to get to them, and um, it looks just like you're holding a magazine in your hand. They're really cool. So check it out on Libby, um, all your favorite magazines and more. Um, and kudos to the Digital Library of Illinois, the consortium that we're working with to provide that content. Um, they were able to expand the, the collection that we already had. And because we're part of a consortium, we were able to increase our, um, our purchasing power. So we were able to add even more titles. So there's far more stuff that's available digitally now than what we had previously. Um, on the physical collection front, um, we've expanded our hot picks collection. So when you walk inside the library after um, many months of not being able to come in, you're going to see some exciting changes first thing when you walk in the door. So immediately to your left when you walk in where you used to pick up your holds, you will find our nonfiction hot picks collection, which has been um, really expanded. A lot of great stuff in that collection. And then immediately to your right, where the hot picks all used to be consolidated, you'll find our expanded fiction collection, as well as all of our hot pick movies and binge box DVDs. Uh, so um, a, lot of, a lot of popular materials there to access when you first walk in the building. Um, the staff has been doing a lot of weeding in preparation for the RFID project and as part of our annual um, collection management uh, responsibilities. And as a result of that, we've been able to implement a number of improvements in the collection that we've been seeking to do for some time. So one of the, there's a couple examples that you can see pictures of in my report, but um, I'm excited that we're seeing more face outs of the collection. So we're using more of a retail model for promoting um, all of our materials. So you're gonna see more face outs of, of popular titles in the stacks that kind of give you an idea, oh, I must be in the science section right now. This is a science title. Um, uh, we're also trying to promote ease of access of the collections with the goal of removing items from the tops of shelving units and from the base of the shelving units. So um, that's something that's been on my laundry list for a long time. It's hard for our staff, our shelvers, to get to the materials that are on the very base of, of the shelving units. Um, we frequently call it the bottom shelf, but it's not really a shelf. It's the base of the unit. Um, so in order for, for folks to not have to lay on the floor to see what the call numbers are, we're trying to get those things up and make them more accessible. And uh, some items that were on the tops of shelves as well, we're trying to bring down and get them into um, better view. So that is a project that's in process. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the weeding, uh, particularly in the 900s portion of the collection, which is our history collection, that's the room that's just off of uh, where you'd find BDU. We've done a substantial amount of weeding in that room that's enabled us to backshift the collection a little bit and to do a project that I've long wanted to see us accomplish here. And that is the consolidation of all of our nonfiction DVDs. Um, so if you like to watch documentaries, um, if, you, if you're one of those folks that just sees yourself scrolling through your Netflix queue and trying to figure out what you're going to watch tonight, um, then you're one of the people who likes to browse by format. And I think a lot of folks like to do that. So what we've been able to do is to go through the entire nonfiction collection on the lower level, pull out all the DVDs that had been interfiled with their subjects, which is still a great way of promoting the collection. But we're gonna try a new way this time. And for folks who know that they wanna watch a documentary DVD, we've created a special collection just for them. So right at the end of the 900s, and immediately below the media room above, we have all of our nonfiction DVDs on display. And my gosh, they really shine. It's cool to see just how much stuff we had in that collection when it's all put side by side, you can really see a lot of cool stuff there. So definitely come and check out the new nonfiction DVD collection in the 900s room. 
We've also been able to consolidate all of our great courses into that space as well. So we feel that those collections really align. We brought the great course audio collection that was upstairs to be downstairs with that as well. So all of the, the course learning material has been collected in one space. And what that's enabled us to do upstairs in the audiobook collection is to free up a whole nother range of shelving units that allows us to spread out a little bit um, and to not have patrons searching on the tops and bases of shelves to try to find those materials. So we were able to spread out by moving that great course collection downstairs. Um, we've also created a new book club hub. The book club uh, collection used to be located back by the fireplace in the recent arrivals area. And in a partnership with the friends, um, we have um, added this space now to the annex, um, which is close to the, re um, the reference desk. There's a special space now for folks who have book clubs. Uh, we're calling it the book club hub. And uh, so we've got a whole bunch of resources in that space on how to start a book club, um, how to successfully run it, some promotional materials, as well as our vast and popular book club collection. Um, you don't necessarily have to take an armload of those books for your book club. If you see a popular title there that you want to check out, you're certainly welcome to do that as well. But it's a really great way to promote um, the love of reading and discussing those materials um, with that little space there. Um, all right, I've already talked about the open holds in the reader's advisory area. So um, I guess... Did that make sense to you all that we've um, we've kind of freed up some space in recent arrivals to hold all of the hold material? Um, I guess what, what the piece I wanted to share with folks is this isn't the permanent resting place of our hold material. I think the re the renovation that we're going to do of the first and lower level, you know, two three years from now, will likely be able to 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 help us better pre present the holds collection. As it stands right now, we've had more holds than ever because the building has been closed. It's been the only service model for us to get material to our patrons. As a result, our holds are going like crazy and we didn't have any space to promote them, which is why we had to consolidate a lot of our recent arrivals materials. There just wasn't enough open shelving space for us to put all the holds. So right now, um, that wall, if, you kinda, if you're walking into the library and the recent arrivals area is immediately to your left, um, you will see that that wall that's kind of right in front of you and to the left is now filled with all the holds material. Um, there's still some recent arrival material um, to the back of that wall, but the overwhelming majority of the content there is the stuff that's waiting for patrons to pick up. Um, we anticipate that once the library is able to be reopened and that we're able to sustain being open for a period of time and not have to do just the parking lot pickup service model, that that hold shelf will likely start to diminish as patrons come back in the building and do their own browsing. We may be able to find a better location for that collection going forward, but for right now, this is the space that we've had to allocate to it as there was no other open space for us to do that. Um, so any questions about open holds or the recent arrivals area? All right, um, a couple other details from my report then. Um, just a reminder that the Winter Reading Clubs um, sponsored by the Friends of the Library continue through March 1st. Um, as, you, as you may know that the, the finishing prize is a gift certificate to the bookstall. Um, so we encourage participation in that. Um, our community services team has been doing so much work in preparing the library for reopening. I, it would be remiss if I didn't mention that, that we've got an awful lot of signage that's gone up around the building to promote these new collections, the way things have been moving around and so on. Um, so you'll see a lot of new signage when you come in. I also want to give props to our community services team, Sarah Beth and Sarah Rose. Um, they designed the, the wrap for our van and on page 12 of my report, you can see a sneak preview of the van with its wrap applied. We received the, the van last Thursday and um, it looks really sharp. So when you pull into the parking lot for parking lot pickup or if you come to visit or just to drop off things in the book drop, you'll see the van. It, it definitely mm -hmm. shows. It, um, it looks like it's branded just for the library and we're really excited once the weather gets better to take it out and show it around town at the farmer's market and a bunch of other events um, and with other community partners. So again, we're really thrilled about that. And gee, that took a lot longer than we were anticipating it to get applied. I definitely wanted that done before the snow fell. And sure enough, the wrap got applied, I think on the coldest day of the year. Um, all right, that's kind of, I think, everything from, from my report. There are, are three other items I want to cover here, but I'm going to pause. Could I just first. comment on one thing, Anthony? Yeah, uh, go ahead. I just, all I saw was the picture of the van, but I was like, 
whoa, <laughs> I mean, it really, really looks great. And I think it will draw a lot of attention and just remind people to come and get some books. But that's, I'm so happy we're able to get that project done. Thank you. Thanks for your support. And Jan, you'll see that right next to the charging port, it says, I'm electric. So uh -huh. folks know that it's wonderful. A vehicle. Best of all worlds. <laughs> all right. Any other questions from my report? All right, seeing none, um, a couple couple final items that were addenda to my report. Um, you'll see that the per capita grant uh, content um, is complete and is ready for submission um, with Kenilworth's um, application. I do both of those. Um, this has been a procedure that we typically have had board approval on, but I've learned that as part of this process, that actually that that is um, that's no longer considered necessary. This is an operational responsibility of the director and doesn't require the board to get involved. And because the deadlines sometimes fall um, before boards can actually vote on them, kind of worth being a, a great example, they don't meet again until April, um, so they can't formally approve that report. Um, the state library has said, you know, this is an operational detail um, that you should just make sure that your board is aware that you're submitting that application because it does have a dollar figure associated with it, but it doesn't require their actual vote and approval. So I'm going to go ahead and process that report. I want to thank you all for taking the time over the course of this last fiscal year to review the standards um, with me and go through those checklists. You'll see in, in the uh, per capita grant application report that there are a few areas that I've identified that I want to work on. Um, we did meet all the standards, but as I said, we can always improve. So there are a number of details that I want to make sure that we can build upon, and I reflected those in that application. Um, right behind the per capita grant application is a piece of correspondence. We received a letter from Jan Schakowsky. She was congratulating us about our five-star rating. Um, she saw the news that we were deemed um, the number six library per capita in circulation for um, the, the country. And uh, she was impressed that we are in her district and wanted to celebrate that with us. So you can see Jan's letter in there and that's really nice um, that, that she took the time to do that. Um, and you'll also see that there was a letter that was included um, from Trustee McDonald as she's participating on the Village's Sesquicentennial Celebration Committee, and that committee is soliciting input. So, Lisa, do you want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, just briefly. And if you belong, the library will be participating and through Anthony and through the different leadership chair in terms of doing programming. And we'll be doing programming in conjunction with the historical society. But I think this is the opportunity if you've got a church youth group for the uh, Friends of the Wilmette Public Library or for the League, they are soliciting ideas. And you can just go to the website if you've got an idea. And they're trying to figure out what to do for the 150th anniversary, which will be a year long celebration in 2022 to celebrate Wilmette and being here for 150 years. I know the, uh, the library wants to focus, I, and, and Anthony and I have talked, as well as the um, Historical Society. Ideally, we would like to gather stories from different people, sort of like what they did at the Chicago Cultural Center in terms of having somebody come and do interviews and collect oral histories within the area. Also, I think it's an excellent opportunity for the library to look at what the future, what they, what citizens want the future of the library to look like. And it'll sort of fall probably post our strategic plan or maybe with our strategic plan based on what's happening with COVID. So, but they want all organizations to be involved and you've got some ideas that they we've sort of brainstormed on, but just sort of take this to your Wilmette organizations and brainstorm as to, how you might want to celebrate the 150th year. Okay. I have a suggestion. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. We also, that uh, next year will be the 120th year of the library's service to Will Matt. Mm -hmm. And so I think that perhaps that might be folded into the village wide celebration to note that. We've had a library at our present location for most of the past 120 years. 
Um, the library received its initial uh, Carnegie Foundation grant for library construction in 1902. Uh, and that's also when the library um, was initially created. We became a library district in 1975, but the library has functioned uh, since 1902. Okay, thank you. If you got any questions, call me because it's a work in progress and mm -hmm. we're working with all the, and they want to get everybody. And so one of the things I'm gonna propose, cause I know Dan kept thinking that the library should do a central calendar in the past, but I think it's a good opportunity to put together. This may facilitate that with all the different organizations coming together and have mm -hmm. the village do it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that's it. <laughs> and the library is also gonna send this notice out at the end of the month. To, uh, to the residents with a link to the village site so that they will know, you know, just to promote the submission and of ideas and thoughts as to what they might want to do or thoughts of, in terms of what might happen for that celebration. Okay. Well, we got to make sure that Ron at least does an oral history of the library so we get all this institutional knowledge documented. Um, yeah. Good idea. That'd be good too, but also. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. family history would be wonderful. Oh, no, I, I love that idea. Of, yeah, no, you know. because I think there are a lot of, I live in West Wilmette. So West Wilmette has a whole different flavor than East Wilmette. So I think some of the histories of some of the families that have been here long might be interesting and intriguing. Mm -hmm. And the Historical Society is excited to work together. And I think it's a good combination of the two. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Thank you. All right, a couple other um, items to note here on the agenda. Um, as you all know, we are in an election year and the April 6th uh, consolidated election um, will feature uh, six trustees, uh, candidates running for three seats. Um, there will be a candidate forum that the library is sponsoring along with the League of Women Voters um, that's gonna be held um, on two separate dates. Uh, and those are listed on your agenda there on Saturday, March 13th. Uh, there will be a meeting where you'll get to meet the candidates for the village board, the park board uh, on the 13th. And then on the 20th, the following Saturday, the library board, uh, District 39 and District 203's candidates um, will all have an opportunity to um, let their constituents get to know them. So um, happy to, to be able to, to partner with the, with the, the league again and um, look forward to that event or those events mm -hmm. rather. What does that partnership look like in a Zoom environment? <laughs> I'm just curious. I, I know uh, that the library will be talking about the library, but I'm just curious what that partnership looks like in a Zoom environment. Um, I have a couple reps from the league on the call. Um, do you folks want to comment on that so that I, I give that appropriate credence, uh, Georgia? Sorry, I can't. I can't give you any. Uh, any details? <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I, I don't know exactly what, what this looks like, but it's my understanding, Lisa, that we're using the library's Zoom account to host okay. the event. Um, gotcha. And we have experience with facilitating large events like the other author events that we've done um, mm -hmm. previously. So I, I think mm -hmm. that's partly how we're going to leverage this. Okay. We're providing some infrastructure and promotion. All right, uh, the other item on the, on the agenda too, and you're sure to hear a lot more information about this is um, our selection for our OBER, our One Book Everyone Reads program. Um, our title um, will be uh, discussed with the author on um, Wednesday, April 14th. And the title is Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu. It was the National Book Award winner for fiction this last year. Uh, we're really excited to, to host Mr. Yu uh, coming up in April. So stay tuned for more information about that event. The book is available already, um, and there are a lot of holds on this one now. So um, we encourage folks to, uh, to get on the list and or try to find it um, instantly available on our digital platforms. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be a fun book, isn't it? it, it uh, fun is a word. Um, it's uh, it's written like a screenplay, um, okay. so it's it's definitely a unique style, um, mm -hmm. and it, 
it certainly uses that style well. So it's um it's good. a very interesting read for sure. Yep, I good, think it's going to generate some great conversation. Mm -hmm. All right, um, so we've got some new business on the agenda as well. Um, Lisa, do you wanna give a, or Lisa or Stewart, do you wanna give an update about the legislative breakfast from yesterday, President's Day? Yeah, I'm gonna give one, it's not a good one, but we've talked about it. It was Zoom, but it was Zoom webinar, so there was no chance to really interact or to network, which was, and they charged the same rate as if you were going for breakfast. Yeah. And the only thing, <laughs> Stuart may have a complete end. The thing that they're focusing on is basically, I know the per capita grants increased for the first time in 26 years last year. So they're hoping that they, uh, it holds steady. But most of, I think the talk was on some of the infrastructure laws, uh, in infrastructure projects that are coming up and while it may not benefit us, it will benefit communities as a whole if it passes that don't have libraries or don't have adequate library facilities. Mm. And that, I mean, there wasn't anything that insightful. And Stuart, what were your thoughts? So, uh, that yes, was your I, first time attending. Yes, yeah, and I, and I, uh, but I, I would, what I would say is I was disappointed that there wasn't a more extended Q&A because it, it just didn't allow for it based on the, on the time frame. Um, and the only other point that I thought, and I can't remember which representative raised this, and I wish I could give them credit, but one of the things that they talked about I thought was interesting in terms of the general evolution of libraries post-COVID um, and how mm -hmm. there are things that, that that's something they felt was very important. And I do think it's very important for libraries to focus on because we don't know exactly you know, what, what, what our new norm is going to be post-COVID. And that's in general in our lives, but obviously in terms of the library, which obviously accommodate is a you know, very public um, uh, entity and, 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 and functions, um, you know, with lots of, lots of um, public interaction. So I thought that was a very good point, at least to kind of be aware of, of ways we might have to modify um, the way we run the library. Uh, can, but we can't know fully what that is until COVID is a little more clear to us um, how to handle it. Sure. It was definitely a different experience than what we've had in years past. Um, I, I certainly think that one of the great strengths of, of the legislative breakfast is an opportunity for trustees and um, library administrators to be able to, to meet directly with the legislators. And um, that was, I think, you know, to Lisa's point, that was something that was missing from this, the networking portion of it. There was certainly opportunity for Q&A, um, but it, it kind of lacked um, that, um, you know, I think what the, the real impetus for those meetings is, is to, you know, engage directly with constituents and, um, and to speak with the legislators about what their concerns are uh, so that we can understand um, what the legislative process looks like and what the key priorities are and what things are like in Springfield in general. Um, and to hear from our federal um, officials as well. So um, overall, I think I, I really applaud ILA for, for making sure that they're putting together these networking events around the state, despite the fact that we're in the pandemic. But I do think that that's some great feedback, Lisa and Stuart, and I will certainly pass that along to, um, to ILA so that they're, they're aware um, of our feedback. And they gave this little the summary of what they're focusing on, and I can send it to Anthony and he can to distribute to you all in terms of what their initiatives are, in terms of what they're lobbying for. Well, if it's, any, if it's any consolation, the House and Senate rules essentially say no members of the public will be coming to Springfield this year. So you are experiencing what every lobbyist is experiencing, that there is just no in-person interaction at all. But still, I've been on webinars where you could see who was attending. You didn't even know who was attending. Oh, I, I got you. And then you could chat with other people that you knew on the sidelines when you got, you know, to get what you want. They didn't even allow that function. Oh, I got you. And there are all sorts of ways that I've done it where they've gone in the rooms, you know, you could, they could have put you in discussion rooms with your representative for 15 minutes. Right. And just okay. done around Robin. So they could, could have improved it. Well, my experience with ILA in their award presentation was that they're a bit of a beginner in how to use Zoom and online meeting tools. Um, the you know, there were a lot of things they were still trying to figure out in a very basic presentation. So I would expect that uh, uh, one suggestion that might be helpful is to 
um, find some libraries that have more experience at handling these sorts of interactions and have them be more actively involved in, um, in the operation of ILA's efforts in events because they just don't have much opportunity to uh, master the skills associated with doing those sorts of meetings. Um, and I think it shows when they try to do a meeting of this sort or, or you know, even the, uh, the simple um, mechanics of the award presentation, they were figuring it out. Uh, and they are not nearly as far along as the libraries that have uh, been running programs like that for patrons uh, throughout the pandemic. Well, I'll, I'll quit jumping on it, but they gave me an idea, Ron, for Anthony to think about, especially since Jan sent us a letter, opportunity for us to build a relationship. We know how to run these events very well, so we may think about doing something in April or May with uh, Congresswoman Schakowsky and some of our uh, legislators, uh, sort of a, a discussion about library issues generally. Um, in order to build those relationships and have that direct interaction. So uh, just a uh, grist for the mill. Great suggestion, Dan, thank you. Okay, is there any other new business? Being there I no comment that um, it is refreshing to see in Stuart's background that there was a time when there was something green in Wilmette. <laughs> That's why I have it there, Ron. It's, 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 just, it's just around the corner. It's just around the corner. Uh, and speaking of green, I, I, um, I don't want to take up too much more time because we've gone past our, our expected, expected timeline, but I did attend the Go Green Wilmette event about dark skies, um, which had to deal with uh, the issue of light pollution and its impact on um, our area as well as the greater Chicago area. Um, and Chicago has the worst um, light pollution in the country. Um, which I did not know. And I didn't think about the fact that over lighting hurts um, animals in terms of their uh, birds and their migratory uh, behavior, other kinds of animals, it disrupts their, their feeding and eating patterns. Um, however, the library, as it turns out, has very responsible lighting. So that was a very encouraging thing. Um, and you can go, and I have the, I have it here on my email, um, the website that gives you a recap of the, um, uh, of what I thought was a very fascinating presentation at www.darksky.org. Uh, um, but, but basically, uh, I think Go Green did a great job with this. They're very interested in partnering with the library further for what that's worth. Um, they think we have very, um, and I think so as well, very compatible demographics. Um, so that's, that's my brief summary of, of that event. Okay. And then just one last thing. I, the Finance Committee met and they reviewed policies. There's another round of the policies. And one of the things we agreed on is Traditionally, the Finance Committee approves it, then it goes to the Policy Committee. We're going to combine those two committees when it's time to review it so that we can get it all in one fell swoop and then bring it before the board. So you will be, Anthony should be sending out a doodle poll in the next week. Yep. So our goal is to try to get this on the March 16th agenda for approval. And if all of y'all are able to attend, um, the uh, joint meeting of the Finance Committee and the Policy Committee for the, um, I guess this will be the, I don't know what, the umpteenth review of, of the finance policy, um, then it will we be can, the second, really. <laughs> okay, the complete, the complete review, um, yeah. then we um, will we'll hope to hold that here in the next couple of weeks. So um, last week of February, first week of March would be my target. So be looking for a doodle poll here in the next day or so with um, some dates and times. Could I just bring up, uh, I'll back up and just what Stuart was talking about. And probably most of us, if not all of us remember when we were talking about the lighting where the garden was that we put in on Wilmette Avenue. And there was the suggestion of solar lighting, which would have been softer. That light out there is really, really bright. Um, just a reminder that might be something we want to think about in the future on that side. Thank you, Jan. <laughs> Any other new business thoughts, ideas? Thank you all for attending. Well, the ILA stuff. I do have things this time. 
Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Let's go. Come okay. on. Okay. Okay. Um, the ILA has uh, always supported vaccine eligibility for the library staff, and it looks like that is moving forward. So that's been helpful. Um, they've urged the IDPH to put the library staff on, on phase B, which is not probably going to happen, but it may happen to phase C. Anthony, you probably know more about that. And then just from the uh, ILA meeting this last time, which was just wonderful. There are a lot of books out. One, if you need something to um, shore up a child who is having problems with the pandemic and other things. Um, there's a book out now called Kiki's Super Strong Double Hugs. And it's by a grief counselor named Judy Schiffman. Uh, Steve Musgrave is the artist. He's done a lot of public spaces. So that may be a book that would be helpful. Uh, there's also a book uh, from the, the li this library director, retired library de director, Liz McChesney, aimed at keep helping kids navigate the emotions of the pandemic. And that guide has a lot of uh, parental resources with it. They had a lot of, uh, a number of really interesting people at this last meeting. Um, the author, Ruby Bridges, uh, there was a talk with Carla Hayden. And if you remember when that iconic um, painting of the little girl walking between the, uh, uh, the so not the soldiers, but whatever, the policemen, into a white school for one of the first times, and she was black, and her name was Ruby. Um, she was, I think, I couldn't tell, but I think she was actually at this ILA meeting uh, and Carla Hayden had a chance to talk with her. And uh, I would have, I didn't get to see that. I would have loved to hear about that. But um, so she was there. There were other people who were interviewed. Okay, let me get it. Um, It was Ruby Bridges with Carla Hayden. Uh, there was an author talk with Ethan Hawke, an author talk with Zig Ziggy My Marley, author talk with Cicely Tyson, and the closing session speaker was Jill Biden. So they had a, a lot of uh, heavyweights going on there. Um, one of the other staff meetings that I have here, I did want to just mention this. Um, the local history library networking meeting, Eva Ann Johnson uh, uh, went to that and I went to her um, presentation from the library on uh, looking up old uh, genealogy records and that kind of thing. She is a superstar. I was blown away, not, not only with just how possessed and calm she was in giving out the information, but just her memory and her fascination with the whole idea of looking up uh, genealogy things. And just a charmer, absolutely. We have to just do something special for her, I think. <laughs> and let's see what else. Um, hopefully not too much more. Oh, the, the only thing I wanted to add is that Carla Hayden is putting together like a task force that um, there's a grant from the Mellon Foundation, largest they've given actually. And they're going to invest in community-based documentarians from new perspectives. This means that a lot of students, uh, young people will have a chance to actually participate in this and there'll be three main programs that are going to reach out to students from minority serving institutions to actually work and they will be paid with uh, her, uh, with her monies or whatever that she's getting there. And overall, her goal is to make the Library of Congress more accessible and relatable 
So it's there are really exciting things happening up there. And uh, I just wanted to uh, say that, or comment on this. The, Carla Hayden said at the end of the meeting, Frederick Douglass said it best, I think. Once you learn to read, you will be forever free. So pretty exciting stuff. That's it. Thank you, Jan. Um, just as a point of a clarification, um, mm -hmm. I, I, that was from the uh, midwinter um, public library or ALA um, presentation. Uh -huh. So um, I think we may have said ILA early on in that. Oh, I, did. I just want to yeah. give appropriate recognition that that's the American Library Association conference um, that Jan was reporting on there. Okay, Thank that you. makes a lot more sense to have all the big leagues there. Okay. <laughs> okay, Madam President. Any other discussion? Is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to adjourn this meeting and also to call for no snow in three weeks. Okay, is there a second? Second. Who seconded? Jan. <laughs> okay, the, the steward has moved and Jan has seconded it. Trustee Barshish, Trustee Wolf has moved, Trustee. So the, is it, can we have a roll? Can we just say all those in favor? Say aye. 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 All right. Anybody opposed? Okay. Have a good one. Thank you. And stay, stay warm. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, so, bye. bye, everybody.